Good afternoon and welcome to the Starlink webinar on curriculum alignment. This Perkins SkillsNet project develops real-time application processes for updating and aligning expected post-secondary learning outcomes to current industry skill requirements. Because the analysis can be achieved through web-based technologies, two-year colleges everywhere will be able to quickly align program outcomes to meet new workforce demands and incur lower costs to achieve the alignment. The user-friendly web-based interface between the massive databases of the WECM and SkillsNet's DWA library are now linked in a crosswalk system developed by TSTC Waco and SkillsNet entitled Skills Outcomes Analysis. SOA provides a streamlined process enabling college staff and faculty to more easily realign outcomes to fit the needs of their employers. During the presentation, you will be able to type in questions. You may do so at any time, and we will take them at the end of the presentation. Let's begin. I'd like to introduce our presenters. Dr. Larry Grulick, Student Learning Project Administrator with TSTC, Mark Enderberg, President and Chief Innovation Officer with SkillsNet Foundation, and Dr. Terry Conroy, Associate Vice President for Student Learning, also with TSTC. Larry? Welcome to all of our attendees. I appreciate you signing in today. I'd like to talk about our Perkins SkillsNet Leadership Grant and the fact that the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board for Texas has provided Perkins Grant funding to extend the use of detailed work activities known as DWAs for updating program and course curriculum. Our goal is to define the relationships between the Texas DWA library created by the Texas Workforce Commission with the Wecom learning outcomes on the educational sides. Our partners in this endeavor are, of course, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, the Texas Workforce Commission, SkillsNet Incorporated, and the DWA Research Institute. I'd like to pose a few leading questions at this time. In 2011, TSTC Waco asked these same questions of some of our programs that seemed to be a little weaker and failing for some reason or not. We were trying to find out what to do and how to fix that situation. So you might ask yourself the same questions we did. Do you have programs with low enrollment rates? Do you have programs with low placement rates? Are program graduates offered starting salaries below the prevailing entry level wage for the training related target occupations? The answers to some of these questions for some of our programs was yes. And so we knew we had a problem. So I wanna turn it over to Terry and have her talk about some of the ways to validate your curriculum at this time. Terry? Thank you. These are probably two of the ways, uh, most common ways to validate uh, curriculum right now. NACOM panels usually consist of 10 to 12 industry representatives. Ideally, they represent technicians recently employed in the field who can identify and describe the tasks they perform in their job. The college would then modify the curriculum based on the tasks identified. But with DACOMS, you have limited industry representation and limited skills analysis of a particular uh, occupational area. You might have a similar situation using advisory committees. Ideally, you want an advisory committee that consists of upper level managers who can help establish interns, internships, cooperative education opportunities, donate equipment and scholarship and discuss the future of the industry. While they represent the industry, they usually don't represent uh, recently employed technicians and therefore might not provide the most accurate information for modifying the curriculum. And just like the DACOMS, they have limited industry representation and limited skills analysis. Larry is going to talk about uh, the various curriculum elements uh, for our that we included in our analysis. Thank you, Terry. After we realized we had this situation with a few of our programs, we decided which programs we wanted to 
work with to ch make a change for the better. So that we were able to get our programs aligned with what our employers were needing in those programs. So what we did is we worked with the this SkillsNet leadership grant. We worked with the partner of SkillsNet Incorporated um, in Wachahatchee, Texas, who had developed a process to be able to link the the DWA detail work activities or the skills of programs that are being taught with the needs of the employers. How do we do all this? Well, what we did is we gathered input from several different sources. The curriculum elements that we looked at were the actual courses within the programs uh, themselves. Each program, each course then had WECM outcomes, course descriptions, and then we also looked at the course objectives. So that was the first input step that we would we use, and that's what we would be using going forward if other schools wanted to also look at their schools in the same manner and their programs in the same manner. So Mark, would you talk about the online job postings and how they validate job profiles as part of our input? What Larry has described in the curriculum elements are the supply side. In labor market analysis, we also need to look at the demand side name of the game is employability and enhanced earnings for your students through job placements. So the central question is, are there jobs out there that match the targets of training in your curriculum? We have new sources of information to help us pinpoint where those jobs are. And one of the most useful that's come about recently are the online job postings, multiple uh, Commercial organizations are out there like Monster and Burning Glass. In addition, there are state-supported electronic labor exchanges that have job postings, and many of the employers themselves post job openings at their own commercial websites. All of these can be scraped and organized, deduplicated, and sent out through a subscription service. And it helps us identify, are there jobs out there related to your training? What do they pay? How close in proximity are there? Are they to your training location? This information is used to supplement, not to replace the standardized uh, information that we have from folks like the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Employment and Training Administration, and the Bureau of the Census that have organized information about current employment and projections up to the year 2020, organized by industry, occupation, and location. So these are the sources of information we have that help us determine whether or not there are employment opportunities out there aligned with your uh, curriculum targets. Terry, can you tell us more then about what the colleges provide in order for, you to, for us to do our analysis and management? So the first step in this whole process uh, starts at the colleges and they take various elements uh, that are probably in everybody's uh, course syllabus. Uh, we use the uh, Wickham or Workforce Education Course Manual course descriptions and course outcomes, as well as uh, the Academic Course Guide Manual course descriptions and now they're putting in course outcomes. The other thing that is added into this process are the course objectives or enabling objectives uh, that uh, determine each of the course outcomes. Mark, would you talk about the labor market uh, real-time online job postings? Okay, the real-time job postings are out there in what we call uh, unformatted natural language text. And we can go through them and distill them into job skill requirements. Using that to supplement the information that's already in the standard uh, labor market information delivery systems. We found that descriptions of the works performed under specific occupational titles in the standard occupational classification taxonomy frequently lag behind rapidly evolving and emerging technology innovations and disruptive business practices because those descriptors are refreshed only occasionally by the Department of Labor contractors using desktop reviews and lagged historic sample survey data. Now that we have access to real-time information through the job postings, 
the web crawling and scraping tools now used by service providers on a subscription basis mine all state-supported electronic labor exchanges, most commercial job banks, and by voluntary consent, a large number of private corporations' websites, job opening announcements. What we can do with that then is run both the standard descriptors and the information gleaned by mining the uh, real-time labor market uh, openings is to translate the natural language text from its unformatted structure using semantic analysis to turn them into a common language called the detailed work activity taxonomy. Larry, can you tell them more about the detailed work activities or DWAs? At this time, I'd like to play a short video that says, what is a detailed work activity statement? So what does the detailed work activity statement look like in skill object syntax? It has an action verb. And we compel them to use an action verb so it is something you can observe and measure. Too many of the old descriptors started with words like understand. Okay. Um, that lends itself too much to subjective evaluation, whereas an action verb gives you a handle on the metrics you can use to finding out, you know, when did it start, when did it end, what was the product. So it starts with an action verb. Uh, the second principal part is the object. You're going to perform an action on what. You can analyze problems. And then you have options. You can have an optional object modifier, like what kind of problems, engineering problems, and you can have a, a context modifier. So the complete statement looks like analyze engineering problems in electronics manufacturing. It has an action verb, an object, it has an object modifier, and in this case a context modifier. Skill object language requires at least three out of the four. Three out of the four. Action verb and object both have to be there. And then you can add either an object modifier and or a statement modifier. So again, must have action verb, must have object, can have one or both of the modifiers. Okay? So this then gets us, when remember I talked about translating uh, Parsi to, to English, we're building like a thesaurus. We're building a lexicon that serves as our computational linguistics that help us translate between employer English and educator English. Once we glean the skills requirements from the employers through the job postings, we have another way to validate what the skills requirements are from our regional and industry-wide advisory boards. What we do is we actually gather the information through an online survey of detailed work activities that are applicable to a particular job. So we look at occupational areas and job titles for that. The advisors then are given the opportunity by using an online web-based process, they can look at all of the individual DWA, detailed work activities, for each course individually. They're able to select the ones by marking a checkbox that they actually want to remain in the program. They can then also modify any of the statements, the skill statements, the DWAs, to read the way they want them to read, and or they can add new detailed work activities at their pleasure once they're given an opportunity by going through this web application. That is another way of for us to find out exactly what the process is for the, the uh, advisory committee to be able to have solid input. So this is done all online. So it's not done in a meeting in a, in a building or at a college. It's done you know, through the web. And this is a much faster and more a cleanly, cleaner way to actually get the data. So we're pleased to be able to have that process because it's very good. We'll come back to this advisory uh, committee uh, activity where online process later on in the broadcast and talk about
what we do as the, the final step of our process. So at this time, we'll turn it over to Mark to give us an idea of the uh, what happens with the relative goodness to fit. Mark? Well, now we have two sets of uh, massive sets of data. One, the information on the learning objectives that are supplied by the colleges. We also have the information about the job skill requirements that we have distilled from both the current employment, employment projections, and real-time job openings. On both sides of the supply and demand equation, we've translated them all into a common language called the DWAs, or Detailed Work Activities. Now that they are in a common language, it's a simple matter of comparing one to the other. This gives us a goodness of fit score. 100% goodness of fit would mean that everything in the curriculum aligns perfectly with the job skill requirements for the target occupations. We get gap analysis when something is missing. We get back a score that tells us three things. One, which of the elements in the curriculum are also identified in the job postings and standardized descriptions. Second, what are in the postings that are not reflected in the curriculum descriptors? Doesn't mean that they're missing from the curriculum. It may mean that uh, the description of the learning materials has not been thorough and exhaustive enough to tell us precisely what's going on in the college courses. And then third, it tells us what is in the curriculum, but is not exactly specified in the job postings. Again, this does not mean that the elements in the curriculum that are missing from the job postings are irrelevant. It could well be that a particular training program targets more than one occupation and that part of the courses are relevant to one of the two targets and part of the courses are relevant to the other. So we give this information back, give us the goodness of fit score, how well do they align, what's in both the curriculum and in the job postings, what are in the postings but perhaps missing from the curriculum, and then what's in the curriculum that uh, has not been expressly stipulated in the job postings. Larry, uh, what do you then do with all this data when we feed it back to you? Okay, thank you, Mark. What I'd like to do at this time is play a, a second short video that does answer the question, what do, you, what do we do with all this data in a pictorial version of uh, that process? What do we do with all this? Well, we can take curriculum descriptions in any format that you've got. It can be for a particular course, it can be down to the lesson plan, or it can be broad SIP descriptions. Stick them in one side of our tool called Job Ready. Over here on the other side, we can stick in job descriptions. We put them into a semantic engine, the, the computational linguistics built around our DWA library. And what does it do for you? It spits out a labor market value index. It tells you to what degree do the skills imparted in this curriculum line up with what employers in the target occupations are requiring students to know and to be able to do. In addition to giving you a, a output measure, it also, notice, say that we have a particular program, 75% match. What about that remaining 25%? It gives you a detailed work activity gap analysis. What is it that the employers, the employers expect that you're not providing? Okay. By now, you have a good idea of what the curriculum alignment process, how it works. What I'm showing on the screen now is a real-time labor market analysis of curric college curriculum, an example of this goodness of fit that Mark was talking about. We've got it displayed here in two different ways. One is a pie chart that shows exactly what Mark said. You see a green portion of the pie chart that represents the skills that are present in both the job postings as well as they're also on the um, they're also in the um, 
the, the program. So the other colors, the pink color would show the skills that are not being taught within the program that they employers want. And the ones that are in yellow, they're in the learning outcomes, but they're not in the postings. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not what the employers want. The second chart is a histogram that shows the, the mix a, a different way. The green, again, is what is in the program and also in the job postings. And the yellows are the ones that are in the learning outcomes in the programs being taught, but they're not in, in the postings. So that's where the program has to uh, decide what they're doing uh, with the program. Okay, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Terry to talk about the review of and modification to the curriculum. Okay, what, what we have is a number of input uh, areas, uh, and then we have an analysis, uh, which was um, uh, that SkillNet uses, and then the colleges get back uh, or the review and modifications uh, information uh, data that Larry just described. Modifications for the college can range anywhere from revisions to a course, uh, replacing an entire course, or making uh, very major revisions to an award. If we could go to the next slide. This is the example of some of the information that the colleges are going to get back. You can see that there's the course information, the rubric, the course title, uh, course descriptions, learning outcomes from either Wickham or uh, ACGM, uh, and then the DWA statements. And then on the far right, uh, we have some uh, uh, color-coded items. Uh, these are these particular ones are in yellow and green. Uh, the yellow ones uh, indicate a very low labor market value. So, getting information back from the advisory committees, uh, statewide advisory committees, the um, real-time uh, job postings. Okay, and those indicate uh, skills that employers. Um, are not seeking uh, or don't place a high value on. The green areas uh, are, uh, have very high labor market value, and those are the skills that the employers want. So the college can then take this information and mod make modifications to either a course or to their entire degree. Larry's going to talk about uh, the next stage, which is the post alignment analysis. Thank you, Terry. So once the colleges have gathered the data, got the, their results delivered to them uh, in a some sort of a dashboard arrangement that shows that and we discuss it with them, they're given an opportunity then to go back and make changes to their programs in it that would reflect the uh, the, the, at least the ones that were in the pink, the ones that the employers want, the skills that they want that are not being taught. After that process is finished, that may take a little while. They're not submitting it to the code board for change. They're just making the changes in their actual input data that they gave us so that the employers will have another opportunity then their advisors through a post alignment analysis to look at that data after it's been changed to re more reflect what they had said they wanted in the actual active during the activity online uh, session that they participated in. So it's called the reevaluation stage of the process. So that really ramps up the entire process and it gives you hopefully a better idea of what happened you know, with us, what we did, what kind of changes were made. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Terry and she's gonna to talk to some of our faculty and the department chairs and division heads that work with this program. And she's gonna, they're gonna tell you what their uh, experience was. Terry? I'd like to thank all the faculty that helped us out in this initial stage of the process. Um, Greg Bond is the uh, director of vocational nursing department at Temple College. 
Uh, Greg, what was your experience with the SkillsNet curriculum process? Uh, thanks, Terry. Um, as Larry had mentioned, uh, one of the items that was looked at very early in the evaluation were programs that had low enrollment or low salary. And this was not really the case with the Temple College Vocational Nursing Program. Uh, we typically have about 300 applicants each year for about 85 positions. So we feel like we have a, a great deal of interest from the community. And in our evaluation of our graduates, their salary seems to be very competitive uh, with vocational nurses uh, statewide. And if we have any uh, participants or any uh, individuals listening in that are from outside of the state of Texas, uh, vocational nursing and practical nursing are, are essentially the same program, uh, depending on where you are in, in the United States. Um, we were able to provide uh, course objectives and course uh, uh, outcomes for 15 of our vocational nursing courses. And the evaluation that we received showed a fairly high fit, a, a goodness of fit with our existing curriculum. Uh, so, so we were very pleased to see that, that for the most part, our programs seem to fall in line with what most of our employers were looking for. So would you recommend uh, this alignment process to other colleges? Yeah, I think it's been a very useful uh, process. We were able to see at least one, one of the more interesting things that we saw was uh, in, in that post alignment analysis, looking at some of those areas that, that didn't fit. Um, we had some questions there on the employer listing uh, that, that some of those job expectations were not really in keeping with what we would consider to be necessary skills for vocational nurses. So I think if, if, um, if groups, particularly if other healthcare uh, uh, organizations or other healthcare schools are looking at uh, doing this evaluation, they need to look very carefully at some of that uh, post alignment analysis uh, to be sure that indeed those things that, that have not fit or seem to be falling out are skills that in fact are in keeping with with what they would expect for their graduates well thank you thank you gina jean is the department chair of the visual communication and design program at texas state technical college in waco um, gina what was your experience with the skills net process um, overall our experience was very positive. Again, it was a useful process and it was very helpful for us to see the specific skills required or requested by industry through those DWAs and align them with our current course objectives and learning outcomes. And one of the main things that we did was take our current curriculum and compare it, but we did it not just for our visual communication and design program. We also did it for at the time it was the motion graphics department. And through that analysis, the decision was made to actually sunset one of those programs due to lack of industry need for the skills being provided by those graduates. So you found the experience very uh, helpful in redesigning or looking at your program. Would you recommend this process to other colleges? Most definitely, it was extremely helpful. You know, it helped, the information helped us to make that difficult decision for sunsetting the one program, but for the visual communication and design program, we underwent um, pretty extensive revisions in some of our curriculum areas. And that DWA analysis that we got was very helpful in that, in that process. So definitely would um, recommend that. Well, terrific, thank you. Rodney Ortego was the department chair of the web design and development program at TSDC Waco um, when we did this analysis. Rodney, what was your experience? Our experience was relatively pleasant. Uh, it was a very good thing for us. We needed to make some fine tuning adjustments to our curriculum and this provided us the resource tools that we needed to do that. Um, during the process, we were able to find that a lot of the items that we 
were teaching were not as prevalent as some of the new items that needed to be covered. Um, it kept to give us the focus that we needed to tune the degree plans we had. We were able to actually take uh, three different plans and move them into a single degree plan and create a better program for all of our students. So you actually made curriculum uh, in degree changes based on this analysis? Yes, we made several and without it, I, I think the process would have taken us extremely uh, a lot more time than what it did and the information that we got back was instant information. It's very real and it covered a broader area of individuals. Okay, well thank you. Wayne Dillon is a division director at Tex Texas State Technical College in Marshall and they looked at their industrial maintenance program. Uh, Wayne, could you describe some of your experience with this curriculum process? It was very helpful. Uh, we were actually looking at trying to find out if we were teaching and offering all the skill sets our local industries were asking for and looking for. And uh, one of the things that we were able to find out was that we were very closely related to what they needed. We were just missing a few key skill sets. And based on the DWAs that we got back and the data coming out of the skills net, we were able to find and implement some of those things, some of those skill sets that we needed in our courses, as well as update some of our curriculum. We didn't actually change any courses. What we did, we were able to upgrade some of our courses. Okay, well, thank you all very much for uh, participating uh, in that process. Uh, Catherine now is going to uh, look at questions and uh, from the audience. Panelists, faculty, thank you for your time today. I can see from some of our audience's questions that we had some technical difficulties with the videos, and I've been assured by our broadcasting staff that they will be corrected and available in the online version. So, audience, we have about 20 minutes left. Before we finish, do you have any questions for our panelists? Okay, here's one of the questions. If a college were to use this resource, how should they start? Okay, I'll take that. This is Larry <coughs> Grulick. The very first way to start would be to get in touch uh, with myself or Mark Andenberg um, at the DWA Research Institute, and we would walk you through what the steps are for you and what you need to do to make this happen. Mark can talk more about what you know the cost of that would be or how they would go about assessing that. What we would need then is to get some information on the input data that we talked about earlier from you. And hopefully we could gather that from your, your syllabi, from your courses. We would look at every course within a program that you wanted to evaluate. We'd gather the rubric that's necessary, the course description, the learning outcomes, the course objectives, and we would get that information. And we would also ask you to tell us the top three to five uh, occupational areas or job titles your graduates from your program would it be expected to be given by your employers who would hire your students who graduate from your program. The third piece is we would want to get an extensive list and an updated list of the email addresses for all of your advisory committee members that uh, support your program. That way we could involve them and conclude them in the activity where online web-based analysis. Mark, do you want to add anything further to that? Mark? As you approach us for these services, one of the things that uh, Larry and I discovered is that you need to have very clean and clear and exhaustive statements about what your learning objectives are. Here in Texas, the colleges are operating under uh, a state mandate to provide 
very detailed syllabi online for all of the courses that specify the learning outcomes. And when I say specify the learning outcomes, the syllabus should say more than uh, this week's lesson plan, you're expected to read chapter six in textbook X, Y, and Z. Um, we need to have very clean, clear descriptions of your learning outcomes. They don't have to be phrased in detailed work activity statements. We do that translation. But uh, one of the things that's going to happen is that we cannot serve you well if what we provided initially are inadequate descriptions of what it is that you're attempting to do through your curriculum. Okay, well, thank you. We have another question. Will the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board require all workforce programs to complete this process? Terry, you want to take that? Well, this, this was a Perkins grant, and I, I don't know that any of us can answer that question here. Um, Will the Higher Education Coordinating Board require all colleges to go through this process? Um, I don't know. I, I would certainly recommend that you try at least one of your programs through the process uh, to see the, the detail that you get in uh, being able to, to modify your curriculum. Okay. This, is Mark, this is Mark again. I, I don't know that they would ever mandate a particular process. But I think one thing that's going to come about, both in Texas and across the nation, is a move within workforce and technical education towards performance-based funding predicated upon uh, job placements and earnings. And that kind of creates a backdoor pressure on folks to do a better alignment of the curriculum to job skill requirements in order to improve the employability and earnings potential of, of their students because that in the end game will be uh, what drives, uh, I think, what will drive funding formulas in the future, not just in Texas, but across the nation. I'm not talking about programs, community colleges that are done for developmental ed or for academic transfer to four-year institutions. I'm talking specifically about the career-oriented technical workforce prep programs. The incentive will will be there through funding streams to get people to improve and streamline their processes for curriculum alignment. Okay, thank you, Mark. We have another question. How do we take advantage of this process as the panel folks did? I'll answer that. This is Larry. Um, at the present time, I have submitted a third year grant, a Perkins grant to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and in that grant, I proposed that I would look at 18 additional programs at other colleges uh, who want to have their programs evaluated. There would be no cost to the colleges to do that if we are funded under the grant. All the payment of all the fees and all the costs and travel, uh, everything is paid for by the grant. The only thing that you would have to do perhaps would be drive to Waco or come to Waco uh, and, and give up your time. So that's something that's more valuable than, than money. But uh, the thing is, we would probably want to see and talk to you on the front end about how you'd go about gathering the information. So you get the exact uh, way to do it so there wouldn't be anything uh, standing in the way of us being able to, to solve your problem or look at your program and give you some detailed uh, results back. I assure you that if you decide you want to do that, that you will be as these other faculty and division chairs and department chairs have said, you will be enlightened about this revolutionary process and be very happy and probably want to do one or two more courses. So, but I've got it right now proposed to the co board. I talked to them today. They're deciding on what uh, grants they're going to fund. And the uh, lady that I work with, uh, Donna Carlin, said to uh, let you know during this uh, webinar that they uh, are in the process of making that decision and it should be coming any day now as to whether this is funded or not. So uh, what we'll do, uh, we get to another slide later on, you'll see my <clears throat> telephone number and my email address. And you'll see also the same information for Dr. Conroy and Mark Anderberg. So you could contact 
either one of us letting you know that we let, let us know that you're interested and we will put you on the list uh, in priority order as you call in for your request for the program. Uh, so that would be my answer to that. Okay, thank you, Larry. Uh, we have another question. What was your average response time for curriculum revision? Okay, I was going to mention that as one, answering one of the other questions. So I'm really glad you, the, the person asked that question. From the beginning and the very start of it, it took us about oh four months to actually, from the time we actually started collecting the data until we were able to provide results to the colleges for that uh, results of the uh, event analysis that we did. So what we've done in the second year of the grant, we had funds to automate the front end of this process. So we collect the information very quickly. We are right now developing a, a video that would be handling all the keystrokes that you would need to put it into our, your data into our skills outcome analysis, the SOA system we talked about earlier in the program. And Catherine has mentioned that also in her opening statement. So what we would do is we would get that information much quicker by using that process. Before we had to use templates and uh, cut and paste, this would make it a direct line into our program. That information is then sent directly to uh, SkillsNet and the DWA Research Institute, who would then ana analyze that program. We're thinking it would probably take uh, maybe a week worth of time per program to finish the results and get those done. Once everything's been collected, now there's also the process of the realignment, uh, the last step of it, where we'd actually go back out to our advise your advisory committee and get input from them once you have made changes. So that doesn't include the time that you would actually make changes. We'd get feedback to you on your changes. That that might take, you know, uh, still about four months to do that. But it's going to be much quicker in gathering the information and getting uh, results for that that we could deliver to the colleges. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I see that Donna Carlin from the Coordinating Board is monitoring our presentation today, and she responded to that earlier question with, we don't have any plans at this time to require all programs to go through this process. Thank you, Donna. We appreciate that. That's helpful. Yes. Yes. Uh, let's see. We have some other ones. Since I was not able to hear the video, I'm not certain if it was the software uh, a program can be accessed. And the answer to that is yes, this can be accessed um, online. And I'm going to ask our staff if they would uh, put in the, the link of the website, and I can give that out to everybody before we're through today. Um, let's see, another one. Uh, how have you tracked the success of these curricula alignments? Could you repeat the question? Yes. How have you tracked the success of these curricula alignments. Okay, I guess the, the the way we did that at TSTC Waco in our first year, that's the only ones that we can really talk about because we just finished the results part for this second year. But the first year, you heard from Geenan, you'd heard from Rodney, uh, what was done with the programs here at, at Waco. And the, the success is that we were able to uh, make major needed revisions to our, for example, our web development program and consolidate where we were teaching, giving three awards. We're just doing one now. And as of, uh, I think, the fall in September, our web development program will now be 100% offered online. So that's a real major change. I think that's probably the best uh, way we are tracking it, is getting information and feedback from our uh, users who have actually submitted their data to us and we've gotten that back to them. Okay, Larry, this is, this is Mark. The ultimate proof of the pudding is whether or not the changes increase the job placements and earnings of your program exiters. Right. Texas and all other states have uh, student follow-up systems in place. The problem is that the data are not yet right. The first changes were made after the initial Perkins grant year. Uh, it takes time for those changes to then uh, be put into the curriculum for students to be recruited and to uh, complete the program of study and come out the other end of the training pipeline before you can do the automated student follow-up on them. But uh, the systems are in place to measure the impact that the changes in the curriculum have 
on employability and earnings of the students. In the meantime, we get to take anecdotal information from the program directors who are in communication with their business and industry partners uh, to determine qualitatively rather than quantitatively whether or not the uh, the impact has been a positive one. Okay, thank you, Mark. I have another question. Does this process require the purchase of technical support from you? Mark, you want to answer that? Okay. The, the one thing that needs to be clear about the grant application that is in for third year, and that is it will be limited to uh, 18 programs, probably at six colleges in Texas with the uh, grant covering the cost. What we would do would provide, we would provide the same services to persons that did not, or to institutions that do not get in on that limited Perkins grant and deliver them at the same cost as we are pricing it out through the grant on a program by program program basis. So yes, there is a, there is a cost then uh, for the resources uh, that are provided by uh, SkillsNet to, to actually analyze the, the program. It's a, you know, it, it's a small amount to pay for what the results are from what we've seen already in the programs that we've, that we've worked with. So hopefully that's, uh, you know, okay with um, everybody that uh, they understand that part of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, has this process been used with a more generalized degree program, such as business administration? Uh, this is Mark again. What we're doing is focusing expressly on the uh, workforce education, career and technical education, as opposed to, say, a liberal arts program. Uh, problem with, with I don't want to take business administration. Let's take this take English. English doesn't necessarily map one to one with any particular occupation, other maybe thought comes close to journalists. But what we need to do this is actually a matching process between the learning outcomes of a technical or workforce ed program and a specific occupation that is related to training. Where we've got a a a general, uh, a more general education program that doesn't map very closely to a small handful of occupations. Basically, what you get back are uh, goodness of fit scores, relatively low goodness of fit scores, and relatively huge gap analysis. This is Terry. Uh, we would love to have a variety of uh, uh, colleges um, uh, participate in this. Again, if you would contact Larry uh, to uh, show your interest and get on the list. Uh, uh, the more programs uh, that are evaluated, the more variety that we have. Um, the resource that we'll make available on our website as a result of these, it just enhances the, the overall product. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question. Most job postings are for welding jobs that most students do not want. Those jobs are labor intensive and low paid, whereas welding is in high demand. If our loyalty is to the student, do we align the curriculum to match the high paying, less labor intensive jobs? Or if the uh, loyalty is to the employer, do we align them to match the lower paying jobs that are required? Can you address this situation? I, this is Larry. I, I don't think we have to make a decision like that. I think we can look at all programs. Uh, you know, for example, we looked at the child development program at Temple and we looked at the uh, vocational nursing program at Temple this past year. The salary that is being received by vocational nurses is probably double what you would expect to be uh, paid for the child development program. And the department chair for child development at Temple understands that. But the, the point is a lot of her students are already in jobs and uh, in, the, in the workforce in child development. They're just trying to improve their status and, uh, and increase their job, their career status by getting uh, 
better knowledge and more skills to be able to, to go up the ladder and have a, uh, a pathway to a higher paying job. Right. We're not limiting this to just associate degrees. I mean, we've, I think uh, a couple of programs we've, or awards we've already looked at are certificates, uh, one, uh, cert ones and cert twos, as well as associate degrees. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I think that's it for our questions for today. Before we leave audience, you may be able to access this uh, presentation at starlinktraining.org. Larry, I believe you have some final words for us today. Yes, I do, Catherine. Thank you very much to all of our viewers who asked the questions to, uh, and the uh, faculty who participated in, in giving their um, evaluation of their experiences. At this time, what I'd like to do is invite everyone who's listening to come to TSTC Waco on August the 13th for a live presentation of results that for years one and two, you will get the full benefit of all the information that we have gleaned from our studies of all the programs. It will be very detailed towards the results. This webinar was really uh, formulated on the basis of being an overview for colleges to be able to, to understand the process. But if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of what we did and what kind of results we got and what they look like, what a dashboard for a program results would be back, uh, look like we will have that available from 9 to 3 on August the 13th. If you're going to come to TSCC Waco, you would need to contact Lana Anderson on the actual uh, advertisement I have on the screen at her website, lanaanderson.tscc.edu, and RSVP so we know how many people are going to be in the actual uh, room when we actually make the presentation. Uh, Mark Enderberg will be there, I will be there, and Terry will be there to ask answer any additional questions that you might have. We are also, and thank you to the, thanks to the co-board, we have uh, uh, le le lecture capture equipment that we purchased last year, and we will be live streaming the, that particular broadcast for that web, that workshop from 9 to 3 on that same date, August the 13th. If you miss that, then what you could do is we'll have that on our TSCC Waco website also in, a, in an edited form, a little edited down from all the hours and give you the highlights of that also. If you're planning to do the live streaming, we will not, because of the setup with the company called Livestream, we will not have the link to that particular live stream uh, broadcast until August the 1st. So we would need you to contact uh, Landa Anderson again by her email and let her know that you want the link to that live streaming broadcast for August 13th. And you can watch it at any place you have your computer uh, once you have that link. So again, we certainly would you know, look forward to people who, if you're thinking about getting on the list to add some of the programs if we were funding for the second year or for the third year, I would suggest that you do that uh, and come to the uh, workshop. It'll be very informative to you and you'll know a lot more about what we're going to be uh, doing for you and your programs. Okay, thank you today. We appreciate okay. everyone's time. The slide that's there now has our contact information for uh, me and Mark and Terry. So you can call us or email us after this event at any time and let us know, have any other questions you want to ask us for more detail or if you want to sign up for the, the workshop or if you want to get the link sent to you for the live streaming, we'd be happy to do that as well. And again, I'd like to thank Mark and Terry for being principal speakers on this webinar with me today. They've done an excellent job. And Catherine, thank you so much for agreeing to be our moderator. I wouldn't ask for anybody but you if I ever did this again for a moderator. Thank you very much. Everyone have a good day.